There's a mistake. Moonlight, you guys won Best Picture. You like me right now. You like me. Ever since I was a little kid, I wanted this. Mom, I just want an Oscar. I'm Connor Wolves, and welcome back to another episode of the Ultimate Oscar Showdown. And this week, we are finishing up our tier ranking of the Best Actress category. We've done the 2010s, now we're on to the 70s. Next week, we're going to be looking at the Best Supporting Actor category and working our way back once again. So starting off with the 2010s, tier ranking those winners, then going all the way to the 70s. Then we're going to jump into the Best Supporting Actress category, finish that up. And then next thing you know, we're going to be into the old Oscar countdown season, would it be eight and then having a blast so we're about almost uh, more than halfway through the series and you guys have been showing a lot of support i really do appreciate the, uh, the support that you guys have been showing me commenting down below liking the video that stuff really helps and it's the reason why i do this to create an awesome film community so please continue to do that it is greatly appreciated but if you're new to the series what i do every single week is take the winners from a certain category in this week the best actress category from this decade of the 1970s and i tier rank their performances from s tier being the highest all the way to d tier being the lowest sometimes there are no s tier sometimes there's no d tiers usually a lot in the middle I'd like to give my explanation sort of briefly uh, and also want to note that this is not oh I'm going to give this performance a D tier because it beat out this other performance that I like better. We don't try to do that. We just try to look at the performance itself, not determine whether or not to beat out better performances or whether or not it should have won, but look at the performance just as a whole uh, holistic viewpoint and just determine is this performance good? Was it deserving? And do we think that uh, in terms of a modern day viewpoint, it, it still holds up? But without further ado, let's jump into things with the 1970 winner, Glenda Jackson for Woman in Love, which is the first of her Oscar wins in this category in this decade. You know, we often see the Oscars in many of the categories, uh, these actresses or actors who will get sort of a win and then a couple of years later win again. Sally Field, Glenda Jackson, we have two in this decade, decade with Glenda Jackson winning two and Jane Fonda winning two. Um, the Oscars do like to sort of get favorites and, and reward them. And of Glenda Jackson's two performances, I probably prefer A Touch of Class, which we'll talk about a little bit later, rather than A Woman in Love. But I think Jackson won, and particularly with her first Oscar here, because of the sort of sexually explicit and erotic and sort of progressive uh, and forward-thinking um, viewpoint of, of sex and sexual relationships that I think this movie tries to portray. Uh, my sort of big hang up with the ultimately the, the movie, but in particular the performance, is that this is a very sort of mysterious, alluring kind of a character. She is the character compared to her friend who doesn't really immediately fall in love, who's a little bit more pessimistic about the whole thing, a little bit more mysterious, uh, more of a free-spirited thinker. And I think that type of a character works well when they're used in a, more of a supporting case. See, so you're either very interested and allured by this character or you're somewhat frustrated with it. And I think this type of character, like I said, works in the background where you can be alluring. When she's so in the forefront of the movie and ostensibly the, the main character or the co-lead, we are constantly sort of looking towards her for emotional understanding and sort of emotional reassurance that we're understanding the movie and that we're clear in terms of everyone's emotions and, and thoughts. And because she's such a mysterious kind of alluring character, we don't get that. And I think for some people that can be interesting and alluring, but for me, when I'm sort of constantly looking for something and I'm not receiving it, it becomes more and more frustrating. And then I sort of emotionally disconnect from the film because I'm not understanding why is anyone's motives are going on at all. So I understand why she won, but the movie is just not for me. So it's going to end up into the C tier. Then the 1971 winner, Jane Fonda for Clute. Once again, another actress who wins multiple times with this one, and then in 1978 for Coming Home. And of the two Fonda performances, I actually prefer this one more than Coming Home, and I actually think this is maybe Fonda's best performance. As a call girl who gets caught up in this private eye trying to determine uh, a missing person's case, and then she sort of becomes more involved in into the case as it becomes more personal and about her life. And we talked about this on last week's episode, um, when we were talking about Sophie's Choice, and who and the director of that movie, Alan J. Pakula, also directed this movie here. And it's not a coincidence, I think, that he's a, a director 
who has had multiple acting Oscar wins in his movies because he really allows the actor to, in, in a certain way, show off because he'll allow for these sort of unbroken takes, two, three minutes of long monologues where we see the actor just act. Fonda has multiple um, chances of that in this film. And like, I think, Streep in Sophie's Choice, she has an opportunity to really run with that. Now, of course, it's a great situation, you know, just to be put the camera on you, don't cut for two minutes straight, pretty much just looking you head on and you can deliver these really emotional monologues. It gives you, you know, a great chance to show off. But Fonda, to her credit, does show off, I think, in, in, in a smart way. I think she works very well in terms of communicating the emotional understanding of the story because we have Donald Sutherland's character who's very rigid, who's very sort of tight and, and, and unwilling to give his emotions. So then Fonda works well, I think, as a counterbalance to the story and then also to, to the relationship and just how vulnerable she is. Um, she's sort of constantly worried how far she's going to get into this. Um, she's almost unsure of how much she should be involved. There is a sense of conflict um, within the story and, and un uneasiness within her performance because she doesn't know what she's getting herself into, which of course works well when we get more of the twists and turns of the story. We sort of understand the emotional impact and how it's impacting our characters through Fauna's character rather than, uh, say, Sutherland's character. That's just because of how she's positioned within the story, but it does so well. I'm, I'm thinking of scenes at, at the very end when there's a notable confrontation or when Fonda is talking to her, or her therapist and we get more of her sort of in, internal thoughts verbalized. We really understand that she is emotionally uneasy and recalling some of these situations and these instances, that sort of nervousness, that jitteriness, um, and, and that vulnerability, I think really works well to heighten our tension within the story. So she's really well suited to the story, and I think she's never been better. So for me, she's gonna go into the A tier. Then the 1972 winner, Liza Minnelli for Cabaret. Uh, this movie almost won Best Picture, beating out The Godfather, I think in large part because of how dynamic Liza's performance is here. And for an actress that's had a, a small amount of film roles, her impact, I think, on film history it is really quite large, in part because of how iconic this portrayal uh, as Sally Bowles is here in Cabaret, about a cabaret singer and her relationship with, with these two men set during sort of the rise of the Nazi party in Berlin, Germany during this time. And Manelli is best when she is on stage. I think she is a dynamic performer. Uh, she really is able to, in these sequences when she's on the cabaret stage, confess her sort of emotions, you know, song as storytelling very much is, is clear throughout this film. And we understand where she's coming from and sort of the internal thoughts I think are in an abstract way, but still clearly expressed through these very dynamic and, and bold performances that she has. And then when she's off stage, she is equally manic, but not in, in a performative sense. She has kind of that uh, theater kid energy. She's always sort of bursting around. She's got the very unique haircut, but she just carries herself is very unique and very different, which I, I give her a lot of credit for. I do have maybe a little bit of an issue sometimes when the off-stage performance feels a little bit one note and I want her to be a little bit stronger in some of the more intimate and, and quiet scenes. Um, she's so sort of a, a personality forward and, and bombastic and, and dramatic even off the stage uh, that you wish sometimes that isn't just always the mode that she's on. But that being said, that's not what the movie is asking her to do. She's, she's being asked to be this sort of grandiose heart on her sleeve kind of a performer. And Liza's very well suited to that because I think that's where her, her strengths are. She's not someone that's going to try to not tell you something or, or hide something from you. She is the sort of open book and that's where the strength is of her performance and the strength of the movie lies. So while I do like sort of the onstage performances a little bit more than the offstage stuff, she is very good at what she's being asked to do and what she's best at. Um, so for me, this is a very solid performance uh, that will go into the B tier. Then Glenda Jackson in A Touch of Class once again ha has won her second win in three years. Very much a um, ingenue kind of figure during this time. Uh, I think uh, representative of the kind of the late 60s British boom. Of course, you know, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and music and actors very much follow this this realm too. New exciting movies coming out of this period as well. M music, movies, fashion. And Glenda Jackson kind of represented that in many ways during this kind of turn of the 60s into the 70s. And 
I think this one is more of the deserving winner than say Woman of Love, but it is a forgotten movie. I covered this movie A Touch of Class four years ago on this channel, so if you want to hear my thoughts generally on the movie and a little bit more of historical context, check out that video. But in it, uh, I talk about how it is a forgotten Oscar film. It was nominated for Best Picture, and yet the director is not as well known today. Glenda Jackson, because she sort of retired in the 90s, become an English MP, wasn't a as well remembered as you know some of these other actresses. Jane Fonda, Diane Keaton, I mean, they're still in movies and TV shows today, so we still know about them, versus someone like a, a, a Glenda Jackson, who just didn't have that later period career. It's unfortunate in that regard, but I think hurt her sort of modern day status and then become more of a, of a forgotten type of an, an actress, particularly to someone like myself, a younger moviegoer who has to explore and, and, and doesn't um, have that complete understanding right away. But speaking about the performance itself, I think she is very well suited within this movie. She uses her sort of sassy, sarcastic English wit in the movie to be very funny. You know, I think she's an actress, particularly if you see her in this movie, that could be very strong in the 40s and the 50s. You know, she was successful in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, but she's an actress. I think that it is timeless in many ways. She sort of works very well with this screwball type comedy dialogue, keeps it up very well, but then also in certain moments where she's just able to give a certain glance or a certain look, adds to the comedic element as well. And unlike something like A Woman in Love, this is very much, I think, a movie star type performance. It's not transformative, it's not being asked her to do that. Um, it, it's all sort of charm and, and wit and enjoyability and some, and some romance ultimately at the end. Uh, and I think Glenn Jackson does a terrific job at, at that, uh, really working well with their chemistry with uh, George Segal in the film. So, so a performance that she's very well adept at doing and leans into her persona, um, but is the ultimate, I think, representation of that. So for me, it will go into the B tier. Then the 1974 winner, Ellen Burstyn for Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore, an underseen and underappreciated Martin Scorsese picture post Mean Streets, but pre-Taxi Driver, doesn't have always the stylistic flares of his uh, earlier and later films. Um, but still, I think a very solid, uh, moving humanist drama about a single mother who is trying to do the best for her a young, young child and also develop her own dream and, and find a man who can maybe help her with that and avoid nice guys who seem like they're nice but they're really not and then uh, you know different types of relationships and the biggest compliment i can give person in this movie is that she feels like a real person she feels like someone that you see on the side of the street working in a diner she think completely understands the <clears throat> pathos and struggle and tiredness of a single mother there is sort of blunt honesty the no bull crap kind of uh, approach to living their life that she doesn't have time to waste on games and things like that. She has to be sort of honest and, and when you in incorporate within her life, it, things start to wrap up very quickly and we see some of the more um, dramatic situations that occur because of that. And th that's on the sort of tired single mother element, but she's also able to give her a sense of real personality. And she's not just the single mother type trope. She's also a dreamer. She's also someone who wants better things for her life and is striving for that and has a great sense of ambition and does have this real sort of sweet sparkle in her eyes. So I think Burson's able to capture that element of the character as well, give her more depth than just sort of a tired single mother. So a great humanist performance, very realistic um, to this woman's situation and, and never a false note, which is I think ultimately what you want with actors is to feel true, feel realistic, feel honest. And Burstyn does that to full, 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 full throttle. A terrific performance. So it's gonna go into the A tier. Then the 1975 winner, Louise Fletcher for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I've talked about this movie a couple times now because of Jack Nicholson's award and then also the best picture win. So we won't go too in depth on the movie here. Just to say that I think Louise Fletcher's approach to this character is what makes it so terrific that of course she's being helped by a, a wonderful script and great directors and great actors that she can work across but i think the way her character is positioned it's always in opposition to the protagonists and the main characters of the movie so it's i think easy for another actor to make it very villainous very over the top but she doesn't do that 
She takes it very simplistically and very boring. In many ways, it's approach of the banality of evil. She's not over the top. She's boring. She's gray. She leans into the bureaucracy. She has a very sort of flat affect within the movie. But of course, that's the right decision. It's the smart decision because when you have all these kind of crazier, um, over the top, like performers like in Jack Nicholson or, or some of the other members uh, of the mental hospital, her ability to say calm and reserved is almost, at least from a viewer's perspective, that's rooting with, say, McMurphy, it almost becomes frustrating because of how stilted and how she, she's almost robotic and she doesn't understand, it doesn't have any of these human emotions or empathy. So there's actually that choice of, of Fletcher to be sort of banal and to have this kind of flat affect and to zig when everyone else is zagging that um, is the reason I think why this, this performance is so successful. Even though she's not really a lead actress of the, of the movie, um, she is super really villainous and, and sinister in the movie and that decision to almost do something that's not as obviously sinister makes it even more sinister. So really well done in that regard. So a, a terrific performance that, that will go uh, into the A tier. Then the 1976 winner, Fade Done Away for a Network. Uh, this is an incredible movie that we talked about with Peter Falk uh, in the 70s Best Actor ranking a video. But I actually think uh, Fade Done Away is the main lead character of, of the movie. Her and William Holden are the sort of emotional connection, I think, of the story. And she works here as a brutally ruthless TV executive that is so obsessed with her job that she almost doesn't even understand why she is. She's just been so sort of consumed with status and power and, and being in a, a boardroom and fits really well in that. And Dunaway does a great job with Chayefsky's dialogue um, because so much of it requires you to be intelligent and to know what you're saying and using a lot of in industry terms <clears throat> and have these sort of big grandiose speech speeches. And, and Dunaway, I think, works very well in that often sort of prowling around a, a boardroom or an office or a control panel. She feels very comfortable within that and very competent at her job, which I think works well. You have to sell the fact that this person is this ruthless, uh, ambitious sort of person. So her speed of talking, her passion that she has when she's pitching, say, um, uh, Robert Duvall's character is very believable, is very realistic. She seems like she is very um, emotional about this. So she works well there. and. She also works well, I think, as a sort of femme fatale in that she's very attractive and powerful and, and you understand the appeal of her. But then also she sort of is morally bankrupt, so she constantly disappoints you at every turn. And even when you think she's having this kind of emotional relationship with William Holden, she'll give a line of dialogue, give a, a read of something talking about James Bond reruns <clears throat> or constantly redirecting conversations back to the job that you realize this isn't about love. That you know, she's so far gone from being um, an empathetic person. Maybe she never even had it, had it in the first place. Maybe she's sort of this kind of sociopath and, and Dunaway's still able to sort of reel us in with the illusion and the promise of emotion, but then con continually sort of disappoint us and, and undercut that. And when you think you can't go any lower, more morally bankrupt, she's able to do that too. So she's very competent in this movie, very intriguing and alluring, but also I think the true manifestation of the themes of the story. She's the character that more than anyone else really helped us understand <coughs> how sort of acidic this satire wants to be. Um, I think she's perfect in, in the movie and this is one of her, if not her best performance and, and for me, a, a total S tier performance. Then we have the 1977 winner, Diane Keaton for Annie Hall. And I gushed about how much I love this movie on the 1970s Best Picture Ranking video. And a lot of reason why the movie works so well is because of Diane's performance. Because she's able to take this sort of um, neurotic, writerly kind of a dialogue and uh, put it through a filter and make it feel like it's coming out of a person. Makes it feel like they're not even thinking, that they're not performing at all. Which is perfect for who Annie Hall as a character is. She's someone that doesn't have a sort of, of self-consciousness. She's able to sort of just think whatever she's, uh, say whatever she's thinking and, and be honest and sort of relax in the movie. And, and, and Keaton is totally able to capture that as well. Where in the, the movie there is a sort of sense of uh, maybe Annie Hall's character putting up performance, but quickly on as we know more and more about her, it's the lack of performance. It's the lack of, like I said, that self-consciousness that maybe we perform on a first date or something like that, that Annie Hall doesn't like, that doesn't have. And Keaton, 
And the difficulty is, of course, is that Keen is a performer. She has to act like someone who doesn't care, who doesn't have to put on performance. And that's secretly very hard to do. But Keaton, I think, is perfect at that, at being so relaxed, at being so honest, at being so true, and, and, and very funny and incredible, smart and, and quick uh, dialogue that she's able to keep up with, but also have great comedic timing and, and emotional and sort of honest and um, emotional and some of the more genuine scenes, whether it be her in California or them just, you know, in bed together. Uh, there's always this sense of emotional, emotional honesty. And it's maybe the most true and emotionally honest performance that I've ever seen. It's just impossible not to fall in love with Keaton's character here. And that's a huge credit to her as a performer. So for me, another S tier performance. Then the 1978 winner, Jane Fonda in Coming Home who is a bit of a byproduct of the polar opposite performing styles within the movie because you have Bruce Dern's character who is very over the top and then you have John Voight's character who is a little bit more reserved and the unfortunate situation I think with this character is that it's such a passive character she's not exactly sure who she wants to fall in love with she's not exactly sure why she's doing things but she's so passive she's so unsure of things that Fonda's approach to the character, which is to be sort of unsure and vulnerable, which works very well in Clute, makes it uh, a frustrating experience this time around because we're not exactly sure why she's caring for this person. So therefore, we don't necessarily emotionally invest. And then when we're supposed to have an emotional catharsis, we don't have because we didn't invest in the first place because she's so passive and she's so unsure that we're unsure if we should even care about this relationship at all. So it's an unfortunate situation where I think her character is written very passively. She doesn't take a lot of action. And then Fonda herself doesn't add anything else in terms of the emotional scenes to make us understand why these two are falling in love or why she's helping out here. Then it leaves us a little bit of a, what am I supposed to feel? What am I supposed to think? And then the movie ends and you're, you sort of feel nothing. And Fonda just doesn't give us enough to uh, convince us that she has committed one way or another when she does. So ultimately not a really great written character, but Fonda doesn't necessarily rise above that. Um, so for me, the performance will go into the C tier. And then finally, the 1979 winner, Sally Field for Norma Ray. I still think Field's most iconic performance, and for good reason, excellent as this textile worker turned union leader who tries to get her factory to unionize. The smartest thing and choice about this character that Field makes is her total lack of ego. I think other actors would want to have certain emotional scenes and to really build it up to try to win Oscars. You know, sometimes you watch movies, they have these big swelling emotional scenes and the, the director really wants it to be emotional so they push in and they big the, have the uh, score be really loud and the person's crying and they're giving this big emotional speech. You've seen it before, this is an Oscars channel. And you can oftentimes feel manufactured and forced and like, oh, here we go, here's the Oscar moment, here's the Oscar scene. I think in many ways people do that because their ego gets into it, they want to have their big show-off scenes that they can show off. And Field does the opposite of that every turn in this movie. She seems like she's very wearing, say, very little makeup, um, so she feels very sort of naturalistic and true to this character. When she does have some of these more emotional scenes with the relationship where she's telling about her past she always says less, she always does less, she avoids eye contact. Uh, she says things matter-of-factly, very blunt and honestly. She's not trying to pause out her words to give it an emotional impact. It's, it's the lack of ego that's so great. And because of this lack of ego, because of this person not wanting um, it, we lean in. We sort of try to understand more and become more interested in her. And she feels like someone that works at a textile factory because a person at a textile factory wouldn't want to be, you know, with past marriages and has kids. She, she wouldn't want to be doing this big emotional dramatic scene. She's tired of it. She's done that. She just wants to be a, a straight arrow and, and do things the way she thinks is best and protect the people and care for the people that she loves or which she often does show just not in this overly dramatic way. So I think her ability to remove that ego and that self-awareness transcends the performance into becoming more of a true honest person rather than an actor playing someone else. It really is a remarkable performance. So for me, it will go into the A tier. 
But that's about it, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. Take a look at the list. Lots of A's, couple S's, couple C's, though. But I do think um, the 70s were a great decade for American film. And we see that a lot here but with some really iconic performances. I think Jane Fonda's best. I think Sally Field's best. I think Dunaway's best. Keaton's best. Like, there's a lot of best here. So the Oscars, I think, got it right in many ways. But that's about it, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. Make sure you stay tuned to next week where we're going to be covering the Best Supporting Actor category, looking at the 2010s. Lots of interesting, you know, people. Marsha Hall Lee twice, Brad Pitt, um, Christoph Waltz. Uh, lo lo be, lo that'll be a lot of fun stuff for sure. Um, but that's about it. Until next time, stay tuned. <laughs>